Hi, everyone again. Welcome to the workshop on AI and scholarly activity and publishing. I'm Chris Alfie, your Associate Dean of Libraries and Information Sciences. If you go to the next slide, you'll see that I do want to disclose that I'm the managing editor of Mount Sinai's Journal of Scientific and Innovation in Medicine. And we do use Authenticate, which is one of the tools we're going to talk about today, to screen articles that are submitted for publication to kind of look for plagiarism. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Mia Bolton. Hi, everyone. My name is Mia Bolton. Thank you so much for joining. I am the reference and instruction librarian for Mount Sinai Morningside and Mount Sinai West, and I have no, no disclosures. Um, we are going to jump into the learning objectives, and those will be to evaluate what your field's journals say about AI contributions and how that impacts authors, to identify how to keep sc your scholarly content from being retained by AI systems, and to interpret the output from plagiarism detection software as it relates to AI-generated content. So we will start by examining the activities and responsibilities of authors when it comes to AI. We will then jump into a five-minute activity that will get you exploring your preferred journal's policies. I will then turn things over to Chris, where she will highlight the critical aspect of safeguarding the confidentiality um, of scholar work scholarly work in the age of AI. And next, she will discuss the intersection of plagiarism, AI, and some of the tools available for detection. And lastly, we will talk about any key takeaways and answer your questions. So artificial intelligence offers valuable assistance to authors in various aspects of academic writing. AI can lower the language barriers between authors, aid in brainstorming, organizing material, creating outlines, summarizing information, and so on. I'm sure you've uh, heard of these many modes before. Uh, generative AI can even play a role in refining research methods, study, design, study designs, and research questions. However, it is important to exercise caution when considering the use of, academic, of AI in academic writing. Depending on your institution's policies, using AI to simply generate text could be considered academic misconduct. And some concerns regarding AI-generated content include the production of overly polished content, lacking unique voice, and loss of human touch. It's also important to note that the US Copyright Office does not protect AI to be copyrighted at this time. So the current risks and limitations um, one of the primary concerns when it comes to using AI in academic writing is the potential of, ex of exposing your sensitive data. Authors need to exercise caution to prevent uh, unintended leaks of information when utilizing these tools. Another risk factor to consider is that AI algorithms may engage in data compression, which could result in estimations rather than precise results. Uh, another risk factor um, does raise concern for the potential of generated, fabricated, um, or hallucinated material, which, you know, in most cases is usually not correct. And maintaining academic integrity necessitates human oversight alongside of AI utilization. So over-reliance on these tools um, is something that we do want to stray away from. And lastly, it's important to acknowledge that the training data used for AI may contain errors, inaccuracies, and even biases. So authors must be aware of these pitfalls when integrating AI into their research. The International Committee of Medical Journal Editors mandates that mandates comprehensive disclosure when utilizing AI, and this recognizes the importance of accountability. Authors must take responsibility for the utilization of their AI research, ensuring that the technology is used responsibly. And authors should thoroughly review and edit results because AI can generate authoritative sounding output that, again, could be incorrect, incomplete, or biased. So here I have a quote from the Committee on Publication Ethics. It is their position, part of their position statement that they have recently released, and I will read it now. Authors must be transparent in disclosing the materials in the materials and methods or similar section of the paper how the AI tool was used. Authors are fully responsible for the content of their manuscript, even those parts produced by an AI tool, and are thus liable for any breach of publication ethics. So here, the Committee on Publication Ethics highlights transparency and 
accountability for authors being fully responsible, which you will see is a common theme. So uh, going on to uh, the Journal of Medical Internet Research, um, there are uh, three principles here that um, are outlined by the Journal of Medical Internet Research. And again, accountability and transparency are part of those, um, as well as confidentiality. So while AI tools are incredibly useful, um, they are simply tools, they're not authors. So listing an AI tool as an author could, mis could misrepresent its role and potentially lead to confusion. Uh, to ensure transparency and credibility, it is crucial to detail the AI methodology in the method section of your manuscript, similarly stated uh, in, the previous, in the previous slide with COPE. And if you didn't utilize AI in your research or your manuscript, uh, it is imperative to clearly state this in the cover letter as the arrow points um, to the uh, statement that they wish that they wish for you to include. Um, this ensures that the editorial process is informed correctly about the absence of AI. And it is essential to familiarize yourself with the terms, privacy policies, and data collection practices of AI tools that you decide to use. And Chris will touch on these points um, in more detail later in the presentation. So author guidance from high profile journals. Here you see listed three journals uh, and the summary of their guidelines. JAMA guidelines state that authors must properly report and cite the use of AI technologies. This includes a clear description of any, gen of any AI generated content and citations of the specific model or tool used along with the manufacturer name. And Nature emphasizes the need to document the use of large language models, which are a type of AI algorithm. This, document, this documentation should be placed in the method section of the manuscript. Um, if, the methods, if the method section is not available, um, then find an alternative place to put this information. However, Nature does not uh, permit the use of AI generated images for publication. Um, also in um, in their website, they do um, state that using um, any non-generative non tools um, should be disclosed and they will be reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis. And as of right now, uh, at two days ago, um, science does not allow any uh, generative AI to be used um, in their publication. And the Research Accountability Committee uh, recommends more extensive documentation, such as the time and day um, of use, the prompts used to generate the text, the sections containing the text and or ideas in the paper resulting from the AI. And any of this information should be submitted as supplemental, supplemental material. And when it comes to documentation, um, it can be very helpful for you when you create your citations. So when it comes to uh, citing AI tools, it's important to note that there are no uh, universally accepted citations, uh, a citation format as of right now, which makes documentation even more crucial, as I mentioned. AI generated content is considered an unpublished source, which represents unique challenges uh, for citation. But in light of this absence um, a stand of a standardized format, it's recommended to use a modified version of the personal communication citation format when citing AI tools. Uh, and using outputs generated by AI within your manuscript, it's crucial to provide full transparency and explicitly state that AI was used in your research. And here you can see some of those um, examples, uh, Vancouver AMA, um, and then the APA citation. So now we are going to jump into uh, our five minute activity and I will start my timer once I am done uh, explaining the directions. But what we're gonna have you do is, um, well, the goal firstly is to determine whether your journal allows AI usage in publication. So first uh, you will open a web browser and you are going to search instructions for authors and then the name of the journal in which you would like to publish or your preferred journal. 
and then you will navigate through the site of your selected journal for any AI-related gu guidance on accepted usage or lack thereof. Um, and if you do, if you hit Control F and type in AI, artificial intelligence, GPT, um, any of these uh, acronyms or terms might uh, lead you to wh what you're looking for. And the question is um, for for you is are there is there any guidance at the journal level? What is it? And make note of any other findings that you come across. And we will uh, talk about it in the chat and um, hopefully have a discussion. So I'm going to start my timer now. And you all have five minutes. If you have any questions too, please uh, feel free to uh, speak up or put it in the chat. We'd also love to know what journals you're actually searching for. So if you wouldn't mind putting in the chat what journals you're looking for as you go through the exercise, that would be great to give us a sense of you know, what examples we might use going forward as we do more of these workshops. When you're on a web page and you want to search for words, how do you do that? Is that a, a right click or? So you're going to hit Control F. Control or, F. Or maybe Command F on depending on your computer. Thank you. Of course. The other thing I guess we would share is if you find um, if you find something in the chat that they point out, you know, feel free or sorry, feel free to share it in the chat. Um, for example, um, yeah, I'm going to just put a link in the chat to what I found for my journal. We are at two and a half minutes. You guys have two and a half minutes left. And you have one minute left.
All righty. So I hope that you all found that useful. Um, I would like to know, or Chris and I would like to know, now that you have done this activity, are do you feel comfortable or are you familiar with knowing your role in publishing in that journal? Feel free to raise your hand, speak up, or put it in the chat. I saw a couple comments in the chat. That's okay if no one feels comfortable, but um, I think that it's important to note that there are a lot of similarities uh, across these different journals. However, they are um, intended to be specific to their to that journal. So make sure that you're following those guidelines if you do intend to uh, publish something. All right. And may, Mia, maybe we'll just share a few things from our perspective. Um, yeah. Sometimes it sometimes the journal is going to click out to a higher level policy that's the publisher policy as the whole. When we did a pilot of this workshop, I think many people found that their journals link about it kind of just pointed them back to a larger, you know, Elsevier policy for all Elsevier journals, for example, or in the examples Mia had showed earlier, it's the policy for all of the JAMA network journals, not just JAMA, for example. Um, the, I guess I'd also wanted to share the example that I pointed out in the chat was my journal just issued an editorial itself explaining its new policy and what its policy is. So there may be both guidance on the instructions to authors page, but they may also be pointing you to something that was actually published uh, in the journal. And thank you again for everybody who's putting examples in the chat. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Chris now. Great, thank you. So, so far we've been really focused on the author role and now I'd like us to switch gears because I know many of us are also peer reviewers and editors. And so, although today we're mostly talking about publications, I would be remiss if I didn't make it very clear that in terms of reviewing other kinds of scholarly activity like grant applications uh, are, we have very specific guidance in some cases like from the National Institute health that say we as reviewers are absolutely prohibited from using AI tools in analyzing and critiquing grant applications, primarily because there's no guarantee of where the data are being sent, saved, viewed, or used, which therefore really violates the privacy and confidentiality agreement. So I do just want to say that as we go through talking about this, and we can go to the next slide, Mia, that although we're talking about potential use and reviewing on some of these slides, we definitely want to make it clear that we're not advocating that you use any of these products in reviewing. Uh, so the same article that Mia spoke about earlier from the Journal of Medical Internet Research about best practices does talk about our roles as peer reviewers and editors. And normally this comes up not because we are asking the tools to write our peer reviews for us, but because we ourselves are interested in checking for cases of plagiarism, cases of novelness, one of the things as reviewers were often asked to is to state, is this a new contribution to the field? Is this something already known? And so when you're out there doing the, the searches looking for whether the article you're reviewing is novel, the question of is any of it plagiarized does often kind of arise hand in hand. And so many of the publishers are already using uh, some kind of detection tools to look for plagiarism. And now they're also looking at how to build on those plagiarism detection strategies to also look for AI generated text. Um, and that might be happening at the peer reviewer level, it might be happening at the production level for the journal, or it may be happening at the editorial level. Um, but if we skip all the way over to the right-hand column of this, where we're talking about confidentiality, for both, for any of those roles that we have where it's not our content, the idea of being very, very cautious to review the terms of use for the generative AI and if there's any doubt that we cannot absolutely preserve the privacy and confidentiality of the content, then we should not be using generative AI for these tasks. And the article goes on to say, uh, and it's in a little box at the bottom here, that one of the tools we're gonna talk about, which is called GPT-0, which is meant 
to help you have publications that have no use of large language models or generative AI, um, they, in reviewing the terms of usage for that product, they determined that there's a risk of information leakage and loss of confidentiality. So they really wouldn't recommend that you use it for anything that has content that's not yours, content that you wouldn't want to have disclosed um, out in a public forum. Um, additionally, back to the point Mia made about supplemental materials, you see here that in the accountability column for editors, you might be requesting the prompts that are used, um, especially um, if you're wanting to see those or make those available as supplemental materials. So this kind of ties back into the importance on the author side of really well documenting all of those things. So if we go to the next slide, uh, this is an example of reviewing the terms of use. So these are the terms of use from OpenAI. This is one very tiny section of one very large document. OpenAI is the producer of ChatGPT, which is the one of the most well-known and the most used large language models. So when you start to look at this, it talks about your content, right? And then it talks about the similarity of the content. And this goes back to the question about not being copyrightable because the output could be somebody asked it the same question you asked it, it might get the same answer. And so you're both having the same um, novel content, which is no longer novel. Um, but the part we're focusing on here is the use of content to improve services. And this is really the area where people are concerned that if you give your data or your novel article to chat GPT to ask it, for example, please, you know, please find the copy editing errors in my manuscript so that I can improve them it will be also incorporating your manuscript to improve model performance and output. Um, and so there are ways to tell it we don't want it to do that. Um, and we'll go over those on the next slide. But still, I think really erring on the side of cautiousness, go ahead and go to the next slide, it's fine. Erring on the side of cautiousness that um, if it's something where you want to be able to patent it or have intellectual property issues, you really, even with these safeguards, I don't think you want to be using public uh, chat GPT for this. So when you first log into GPT and you do need to have an account, it will have this box that says, shows you these three things. And one of them here is don't share sensitive info. And when you go to the help center link here, it's going to explain the difference between using GPT with a chat versus using API submitted data. So it doesn't use the API submitted data to train the model. It does use the chat data to train the model unless you disable those settings or you submit a form. So if we go to the next slide, I'll show you what that setting disablement looks like from my free account. So I'm using the free GPT 3.5 and an, above my login, there's this area called settings and you click on settings, there's general settings and data controls. And the default is this green that it's turned on. So you'd be moving the slider to the left to turn off the chat history so that it doesn't use the back and forth to train the, you know, whatever you give it to, to train the model. Now, this doesn't carry over from machine to machine. So I set this up on my home laptop when I came to work today to run it again. I had to set this setting on my work computer so it doesn't um, carry forward. But that's essentially how you are able to to do that basic control setting. So if you go to the next slide. The other thing though, is to really think about are there tools that are safer to use than chat GPT for specific publication related tasks. And so one of the things people are interested in doing many times is, is identifying places to publish uh, or looking for pre articles that already exist on their topic and so, one of the tools that we teach in our library workshop on, on publishing venues is this resource called Jane. And so you can see, I don't know if you can see very well here, but you can paste your abstract into Jane, and then it's going to come back to you and say, here are journals and that publish work that are similar to the things you put in. Also, you know, different keywords if you're looking for keywords um, to do. So Jane does not store the information sent to the Jane server. It runs this, formulates the response, discards it from memory, and also has a scrambling 
input option because it's not the order of the words that matters to Jane. It's the frequency of the words and what the words are. So if you were working with an unpublished abstract that had a decent amount of data in it, and you were like, I want to put this in somewhere to look for journal sources where I might publish, I would ask that question of Jane rather than chat GPT, for example, even if I had turned off chat GPT's um, controls. Okay, so next slide. So, and feel free to ask questions in the chat as we go along. Me and I will definitely take those. Um, what I'd like to do is switch gears now and talk a little bit about plagiarism and AI detection tools that we um, that are out there. And I'm going to be blunt, like distinguishing between AI and human generated text is not easy. Uh, a lot of us have been having fun taking this test, human versus AI, can we tell the difference anymore? And so we'll put this link into the chat afterwards. But I bring this up in part because it's when we start, plagiarism is still a very serious issue for academic integrity and understanding that there are high rates of false positives when you start to use these tools to do detection. I just really need to reemphasize that this is not simple to do. Uh, so go ahead and go to the next slide, Mia. So we're going to talk about two tools today, GPT-0, uh, which is we're talking about the public free version. Mount Sinai does not subscribe to this tool. And then Ithenicate, where we do have a, a 200 user account subscription and you can request to use an account. Um, the, here in the situation we're going to see, and I'm going to show you an example of, with something that we generated GPT-0 doesn't detect plagiarism well, but it's meant to detect likely AI use. Authenticate is meant to detect plagiarism, and it does not currently deal with AI-generated writing. So if you're concerned with both aspects, um, neither one of these tools is going to be incredibly satisfying to you, and there's a, you need to kind of have combinations of tools to get to both strategies. The vendor that makes Authenticate also makes things like Turnitin that work with um, learning management systems. And I think those are evolving. So I think it the AI detection will look different in the learning management system than it would be looking in uh, something like Authenticate that we're using more on the publication side. Uh, so what we'll go, and then there are other methods too that you can do in a more human oriented way to kind of work your way through what do I think is this real what is going on like the decision tree method that's cited here um, but that is an intensive process to kind of work through in your head what you think might be happening with the paper so um, we're going to go ahead and show a couple screenshots just in a minute of GPT zero so what I did was I took something that I had written an editorial that I had written that has a Creative Commons license. It's open, it's an open source, open access paper. And I asked ChatGPT to write an essay editorial on my same topic. And then I mixed up the AI generated text with my text, which I mildly paraphrased in the way that a person in a real hurry, um, not super trying to avoid detection might have done and made one combined editorial. And then I fed that editorial to GPT-0 and to Authenticate to see how it did. So I'm gonna show you these now and then say that after we go through this, we'll ask you to talk about uh, maybe what surprises you or the similarities and differences. So, and this is GPT-0. And remember that GPT-0 is the one where the terms of use say, um, anything you put in here, we can use it for something else. So you definitely don't want to put in anything in here that you uh, need to protect the privacy and confidentiality of. So you can paste in the text here, or you can upload your file in a wide variety of formats, and or you can uh, walk through some of its examples. You see it has one, for example, AI plus human. So we go ahead and go to the next screen. So what I did was I just pasted in that combined paper and said, tell me what you think. And so what it came back is that this text is moderately likely to be written by AI, 72% probability. And then it shows you the, pa the parts of it that it thinks uh, were written by AI. Now, what's interesting about this, and this goes back to Mia's point about documenting the time you 
did what you did and where you did it and all those kinds of things. So I had originally tested this essay at home on my computer at home at 10 o'clock at night. Um, or let me back that up for a second. Originally, we had done an exam. I think that's actually different from 10 p.m. versus 3 p.m., but we did 3 p.m. for, sorry about this. I should have done a better job of documenting. So we did an example. Mia and, Mia and I ran through it at three o'clock in the afternoon, and it performed a certain way, uh, but the screenshots that we captured at that time, we didn't have the screenshots saved properly. So I went ahead and did it again at 10 o'clock at night on my home computer, and my home computer had very different, the probability was the same, the 72% probability is the same. But you see here where it says six out of 18 sentences are likely AI generated. The first time we did it, it thought 16 out of 18 sentences were AI generated, but this thing that we had written then got incorporated into the world of, you know, GPT zero's knowledge base. And the next time it was like, oh, you know, I actually think that less of this is, you know, is AI oriented. So we aren't really sure because it's kind of a black box behind the screen what's happening, but it did give us different, not different probability results, but different sentence matching results with just really a couple of hours and a different computer, you know, situation going on. So not very consistent in terms of reproducibility, of your findings from a sentence to sentence perspective. Okay, so now what we'll do is if we go to the next screen, I'm going to now switch over to authenticate. And given where we are with timing, we'll go live for a second so that if you want to see something other than the screenshots, I'm able to do that for you. And so give me a second to go ahead and go live. Okay, so are you all seeing an authenticate screen? Okay, so let me show one other thing here. So authenticate, this is the library's guide for authenticate. Are you seeing the library guide? So you can sign up and get an authenticate account so that you can do um, the things that we're talking about today. If this is going to be important for the roles you have as um, an author or a reviewer. Uh, but once you have the account and you log in, then what you have are you have options. You can upload a file to compare it against the resources they have available, or you can do a document to document comparison where you upload the documents that you want to compare against each other. So when you, this does set things up in a, a folder structure normally. So the parameters that you want to set up are usually tied to creating a folder. So if you create a new folder for your project, you're going to see it gives you choices to exclude. I'm going to make this a little bigger maybe. So can everybody see this a little better now? Yeah. So you can exclude quotes because those are likely to be similarity matched verbatim. You can exclude the bibliography. There are, if there are certain phrases you want to exclude, you can do that. You can, you can do change it. You can change these parameters. You can also exclude things like the abstract or the materials and methods if you are, you know, if everybody's following the same protocol and therefore you know the protocol is going to set off a high similarity materials and methods, you can just tell it to not look at that section. And so it is searching these repositories, Crossref, which is a major initiative to bring together um, anything that has a DOI essentially um, attached to the article will be something that's available or mentioned in Crossref that it's searching against. And then the ProQuest is the parent company, so their database, the general searchable internet, and then their publications repository. So you usually set up your folder to kind of do or not do whichever of these parameters that you want. I've already set up a folder for our scholarly activities project here, so the settings for this folder um, happen to be to exclude quotes, to exclude the bibliography, and to go ahead and search all of those areas. Does that make sense in terms of the setup? Are there any questions about that? So once you've done that, you can then upload your file. Um, there's also a zip file upload. This is more for people who are teaching. So if you had 100 assignments that you were trying to check against this way or something like that, you could upload a large file um, with many documents. You can copy and paste 
things like that. So I went. I want to go ahead and show you what that report looks like. So I uploaded that editorial, which was 431 words, and it said, you know, it's 26% similarity. So let me go ahead and click on the report so that you can see it. Okay, and so what, let me just make this a little bit bigger for everyone. So each section, it's going to have this pop-up. I tend to take away the pop-up and just go to the full source view um, and look and see where the matches for each thing were, but there's different, let me go back for a second so you can see that. So it's going to show you each of the sources that it found. So it found seven matches um, from an open access journal article from the National Library of Medicine, from the journal that I actually plagiarized it from my own work to begin with, and then from different percentages from different sources. So when you click on, let me move this down so you can see, it's highlighting every area that it thought was an overlap. And so the part that I, knew would be an overlap is this part here, which is the part that I intentionally plagiarized for the part of the purpose of this exercise. It did a very good job of finding all of the plagiarized text that I had put into it. It did find other things that I wasn't, um, that I didn't put into it, uh, including something that actually was citing my text and it thought I was plagiarizing from the text that was citing my original text. So, you know, time passes over um, from when these things happen. But that is essentially what the matching looks like. And then it's up to you to decide looking at the original versus, you know, it'll show you the original and you have to decide, uh, do I actually think that this is really plagiarism or something else? So it, it has a lot of human judgment attached to it. So that's what the reports that's what the reports look like. And so what I'd like to do now is go ahead and go back to our slide deck and actually show you um, how this compared to the original document that we had and, and just have a little bit more opportunity for discussion. And then, so is everybody now seeing the comparison of the authenticate and the original? Okay. So the original here, the, the AI is italics, the plagiarized is bold, and the authenticate report that we looked at, it did identify pretty well everything that's in bold that I had plagiarized. It's like, oh, here's where this reference is. So um, pretty successful at identifying the plagiarism. Really didn't do much with any of my AI text, right? Do you see that? I think it, it only pulled out like this little phrase, which wouldn't have scared me at all, you know, between case reports and case studies. I expect to see that phrase like over and over again for a comparison. Um, so not good on the AI detection as we warned you. Um, the GPT-0 findings, the second round, you see that it recognized that that whole introductory paragraph was AI written and that the whole you know, the whole last section was AI written. This middle section where it's a mix of human plagiarized and AI, and the first round, it did recognize these things as AI, and the second round, it did not. So once people start to mix human and AI text up, I think that the ability of it to recognize that is less. So, if, um, so something for us to think about. Um, so let me pause there and ask you all what your thought that you know, feel free again in the chat or in conversation thoughts on what you saw there with the comparison of the detection. Is anybody surprised, disappointed? <laughs> okay. Um, as I said, I do think we're going to see these tools coalescing more in the very, very near future. So we will definitely do a good job of letting you all know what's happening um, as this evolves for us at Mount Sinai. But those, I, I guess I'm curious, could we have maybe a show of hands in the raise hand feature in the chat? How many of you are actually involved with 
um, editorial work for any journals or publications, because I think that is where you might want to know, you know, is my journal using authenticate only? Are they using some variation of GPT-0 that's private? Are they doing something else? Kind of like, what are they doing? Um, I don't know whether groups are going to advertise that to authors, because I think if they kind of advertise that, hey, we're using GPT-0 for this, or we're using this, the, the idea of kind of having an arms race of well, I warned them, so now they're going to try a new strategy to bypass it, you know, kind of thing versus, oh, it's an important disclosure for you to know that we're inputting your content into tools like this in the publisher environment. Um, so I'm not really sure exactly where all the journals and publishers are kind of coming in on that. Um, I will just say we did try to run one other example. Um, we did go ahead and try to have ChatGPT write another version of that essay so we could use the document to document comparison to compare the AI text with the other text. And it was good at identifying things from the introduction. That was about it. Um, so using the same prompt, but using the same prompt essentially a week later, got us a really different editorial than we got the previous time, different enough that it didn't recognize it as being very similar at all. So I had been hopeful for that strategy, but that strategy I, I don't think is necessarily worth anyone's, um, anyone's time and energy in that regard. So now I think me and I really do want to just summarize and turn it over to questions with the you know, 10 minutes or so we have left. Um, we hope you've seen that a lot of groups, journals, publishers, organizations are in the process of or have already formally issued guidance for us as authors, reviewers, and editors. And um, these are evolving. So I think it's like check often, don't assume like once, you know, once it was said to be this, that it won't change. Um, I do think there's going to be a lot of reaching out to journal editors with specific examples and, you know, getting kind of feedback on things like that. So our, our tips here are research the instructions to authors before you use AI so that you don't have to undo work, especially if you think you might get rejected by one journal and have to resubmit to another journal, maybe check the instructions for all of your top couple of target journals for a publication and really, you know, try to adhere to those requirements. Keep more data than it actually asks for because, you know, that might, the stringency might change over time. The accountability community, as we mentioned, is, is saying, you know, to be much more, especially on the reproducibility side take screenshots and record the time because things, the one thing we can tell you with certainty is that time, as time passes between each of these things, things are definitely changing. Um, and we in the library are here to help you. So you have my contact information, Mia's, you can reach us at the reference desk of the library and we'll drop the library's AI guide and other things in the chat for you. And I think what we'll do now is stop the recording.